Happy Good Friday. Question mark, question mark. Listen, y'all. Uh, this is a wonderful moment that we all get to kind of relive and relish in. Uh, we're all here to uh, remember through worship and through sitting under the word uh, what Christ endured for us on a Good Friday over 2,000 years ago. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the story, then my hope is that by the time you leave here, you'll be very familiar with this God who came from heaven to earth to love us, to lavish us with his love and his generosity. So this is what the, the evening is going to look like because I'm not going to come up here and do too much emceeing. All right. The screens will tell you what's next. That's the way we're going to roll because we want things to flow seamlessly. All right. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have a few times of worship and then we're going to have a few times of instruction from seven people. Well, eight people who are coming up to share with us a word uh, commemorating the seven final sayings of Christ on the cross. So here's my encouragement for you. During the times of worship, stand up and let's worship, y'all. Let's worship like he deserves it. Is that cool? Okay, all right, all right. While the, the messages are being given, let's interact, let's engage. Uh, the major, Many of the people who are speaking tonight are not people who speak often, and so they have been brave enough, they've been bold enough to take on this glorious responsibility. And so what I would like to know is uh, that they have an amen corner here tonight. It's, do we have one or two who's willing to say amen every now and then? Because it encourages us, right? It encourages us. It helps us to keep... Now listen, if y'all don't say amen when I'm up, because I got to preach too, then I, I'm going I'm to keep y'all here for about 45 minutes. <laughs> Amen to help me to get to my seat. All right. So, okay. All right. All right. Take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. Take it easy. So here's what we want to do. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. Immediately after prayer, we're going to jump into worship. Is that cool? Is that cool? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your benevolence. Lord, we thank you for your immense kindness. God, we thank you. We thank you, Father for sacrificing your son for us. We think about this as a day that is uh, so important, so crucial to us, but God, I can't imagine being a father what, what you went through, seeing your son endure all that he did. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for being the kind of God who's willing to give his only son so that they who would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God, bless each person who's going to be speaking tonight. Encourage their hearts so they can speak from a place that they've already been convinced of. Bless each person who's going to be helping to lead worship tonight. Allow them to sing songs unto Zion. Play in a way that glorifies you. And bless all of us who will be participants of this service through not just spectatorship. I don't want to say that. I, those who are, who are going to be sitting in the pews on the outside, looking at the front, let us all be just as engaged. God, we pray that our hearts are deeply encouraged through this time. Do something for us that we'll remember forever. Would you get glory? Decrease all of us, Lord God, and increase yourself. In the name of Jesus, let everybody who loves the Lord say amen. 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 All right, y'all. Let's worship.
grateful. Can you open your mouth and tell your God? Thank you. Lord, we thank you. We lift up your name. We're thankful that for this day that you've made. We're thankful for the day that was made that you hung on a tree. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. Only you could have done it, and we're grateful that you did. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We give you the fruit of our lips. We give you our hearts, oh God. We birth the new, oh God, a song that only we can sing. The angels cannot sing. We give you glory. We give you glory. We say thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Jesus said to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. According to the scripture of Luke, it was a little before noon, right before darkness had taken a whole land. There was Jesus, our Savior, horrifically beaten and tortured, hanging on the cross between two other men who were both actually criminals, hanging to be executed. On the cross, over top of Jesus, was a superscription written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, saying, this is the king of the Jews. Again, Luke 23, 34 says, Jesus says, again, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his clothing, and they casted lots um, to see who gets what, basically. They were screaming all type of things, things like... You know, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, offering him vinegar, saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save yourself. I do want to back up to highlight these words Jesus requested of the Father, to forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Why did Jesus request this? Who is them? that Jesus is asking to be forgiven? Was it the soldiers that beat him and tortured him? Was it those that mocked him and called for his death? Was it Judas who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver? And or was it the request for us, you and I, that sin against him every day? Jesus was willing to extend forgiveness for our past, present, and future sin, which is amazing to me, especially for future sin. The act of for forgiveness is, a, is powerful beyond what we see and what we can even imagine. Forgiveness is really the reason for the cross. This great moment act is actually Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 53. Jesus suffered the punishment for our sins so we can experience forgiveness. The act of forgiveness is powerful beyond what we see and what we can even imagine. Forgiveness is really the reason for the cross. Again, I'll say that. Jesus suffered for us, for our sins, so we can experience forgiveness. Now, that puts a lot of weight on us because we know we've been in situations where we might have had to forgive somebody that made it uncomfortable. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Forgiveness is not an option. If we read his word, it's not an option. It's a must. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus' example of our posture of prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I'm going to say it again because some of us learned it as, as kind of like a Right before Easter, you say this little thing and we just say it. But if we really understand what it's saying, that part of it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So do we see how important and how much of a must it is? We can't skip that. You know, um, I know it's hard, but it's what, it's what God requires of us. Look at, the, look at the change of heart from the criminal on the right side of Jesus. 
Matthew reports that both criminals mocked Jesus. And later, the criminal on the right asked Jesus to remember him. What made him change? Again, look at the power of forgiveness. The one realizing that both he and the other criminal on the left actually deserve the punishment that they were getting. Jesus, who committed no crime, accepting punishment that he didn't deserve, yet still asked the Father to forgive them. So, I'll use a, a practical, should I say, a, a, a at-home example. I remember me and my wife were having a, a healthy debate. <laughs> Those that are married understand what I'm saying, right? You know, being married a while, you, you go through things and you, you're challenged and, you know, the, the other person is challenged. And, you know, this one time we, were, we, were, we, we had this debate and I felt like I was right. A lot of times. So I sat on the couch and I said, Father, I said, God, I, I'm just tired of feeling like I'm the only one forgiving. Why doesn't she see her wrong? I'm tired of always being the one saying I'm sorry. I'm tired of always being that one. And it felt like the Lord said to me, fix your 2%. So if you thought she was wrong 98% of the time, go fix your 2%. I'll deal with her. Fix yours. And of course, I didn't want to hear that. I sat in steam for a minute like this ain't fair. But I knew God was working on me. And I went upstairs and I, I broke down the situation and I said, I apologize. And the look on her face was kind of taken back. I said, for whatever I did, I apologize and I ask that you forgive me. Now, it took a day or two <laughs> for the response, but that's not why I did it. I did it because I knew God wanted me to do that. And how do we grow if we don't lead by example? And then from there, it grew. She learned how to forgive, and our, our, our marriage went to a whole nother level just because of that. So we know how important forgiveness is. Other people see that, and they say, how could he? Other people see actions done to you, and you're able to wave it off because you understand what it takes for God to be happy with you. Um, forgiving others can be a hard and for some offenses against us. Forgiving others can seem almost impossible. I know I can show by hands how crazy some people, some things have been done to people where you say, I'm not, they don't deserve that, right? So it can become hard. It can become hard. Some talking about you, um, disappointment, relational hurt, church hurt, family hurt, betrayal. But none of these add up to what was done to Jesus and what is still being done to him, but yet he still asked Father to forgive us. Now I'll say this. I've never found in Scripture a time limit that he says you must forgive, right? So don't let nobody do that to you, but it's a must. It's a must. It must happen. The Father can touch us immediately to be able to forgive, and sometimes it's a process with prayer. I don't want to paint a picture that we're perfect and we can go through it. No, sometimes I need to say, God, I, I'm angry, but I need you, and I want to obey you, so please help me with this. I do want to encourage all of us in those very hard times that seem impossible to forgive to at least have the posture that we are willing to forgive because, again, we know this is what God requires. Prayer to God. Pray to God, excuse me, I need your help. This is such evidence that we need God to obey God. I'm going to say that one more time. We can't do the things of God without him. Some things he asks of us to do seem impossible, but with his Holy Spirit, we can do whatever he asks us to do. And however long it takes to get there is how long it takes. But we're, we're, we're chasing him. I wholeheartedly believe this and that he will honor our requests, especially if we're looking to obey him. God, we pray 
for your forgiveness, offending you, and missing the mark. As we also need you to help us forgive those that have offended us. We thank you in advance. Amen. Uh, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we just pause, God, to, to thank you. God, thank you for your grace, for your mercy. God, thank you for your forgiveness. God, thank you for loving us to the point of death on a cross so that we can know you and so that we can have relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to gather here tonight. Um, I pray that you will continue to speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in continuing with our theme for tonight, um, the seven last sayings of Jesus, uh, I'm going to be doing the second saying, which can be found um, in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Um, Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and it reads as this. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So I want to provide just a little context for um, where we are, right? And so uh, Jesus is on the cross. He's being crucified. And to his left and to his right, um, we have two thieves, two criminals um, who are also being crucified with him. And they're having a little bit of a conversation, uh, a dialogue, if you will. And so uh, the first thief on the cross is saying, hey, um, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us, right? And so he's, he's mocking Jesus a little bit, saying, man, you're not really God. You're up here just like us, you're dying. If you're really a guy, you could get down and save yourself and, and take us with you, all right? And so um, the second thief on the cross actually replies to him and, and, and says in a way, wait, don't you fear God? We're being punished justly and rightly for what we did, but this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong. And then he says to Jesus in verse 32, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's when Jesus replies, truly, I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. And so I want to make just two points based off of this kind of conversation, this dialogue, this interaction. And the first point is that Jesus gives the thief grace. He didn't earn it. Um, there's nothing that he did to earn it. And the second point is that Jesus gives the thief hope. And so um, just to look at grace a little bit, when Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise, there's nothing that the thief did to earn that paradise. There's nothing that he did to earn this gift, right? He didn't pay enough tithes or say enough prayers or do enough good deeds. He simply put his faith in Jesus and who Jesus is. He confesses his sin. He says, we're getting what we deserve. We're sinful people, right? He confesses his sin. He acknowledges that Jesus is innocent, right? He says, this man has done nothing. This is God. He's acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. And then he puts his faith, his faith in Jesus when he says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. He's trusting that God, that Jesus is capable of saving him. And so when he has that trust, that's when Jesus replies to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. And I think that this is a beautiful picture of, of forgiveness, of grace. Literally, Jesus is dying on the cross. He's dying on the cross to pay for the debt, for the sins of the world, and for this man. He's paying this man's debt, and this man says, Jesus, remember me. Have mercy on me. And that's just, to me, that's a beautiful picture of forgiveness and grace. Forgiveness and grace um, that we all need, that we all need, right? And so, um, I would say, I think that we all actually need to be a little bit more like the thief on the cross. And you don't, you don't hear that often. You don't hear that you should be, you should be like the thief. But um, if we take a look at what he did, he confessed his sin. We need to confess that we're sinful, that we are sinful and broken people. He acknowledges that Jesus is innocent, that Jesus is Lord. We need to do the same. And he put his faith in Jesus to save him. And you might say, why? Why do I need to do this? Why, do I, why is that something that's necessary for my life. And I'll give you two reasons. One, Romans 3, 23 tells us that all have sinned and 
have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. That means I'm a sinner. That means you're a sinner. That means everybody in this room is a sinner. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Later in Romans 6, verse 23, it tells us that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That means there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay for our sins. There's a debt to be paid. There's a debt to be paid. And Jesus paid that price on the cross when he died for our sins. And so that leads me to my second point. Um, we have hope. Jesus gave the thief hope, right? So the thief was, he's in a little bit of a bad situation here. He's, uh, he's hanging on the cross. He's, things aren't looking too great for him. Some people would say he, he was down bad, right? He's down bad right now. He's, he's down real bad. <laughs> he's down real bad, right? And, but he calls on Jesus, and says, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus responds again and says, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And as I think about this, I think about the hope that he must, must have had in that moment to know that I'm down bad. I'm on this cross. I'm dying. I'm paying a debt. But now I have hope, right? And his situation didn't change right there in that moment, right? He's still on the cross. He's still He's still down bad, but he has hope for a future that later that day, later that day, he's going to be re reunited. He's going to be united with Christ in paradise where there's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more sin. He's going to live in eternity forever in paradise. Jesus gave him hope. He gave him hope. He gave him something to look forward to. And for me, that's encouragement. And I think that should be encouragement for each of us. Right? As we live our lives today, there's chaos, there's pain, there's suffering. But y'all, we have hope. We have hope. We have something to look forward to because of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus gave the thief grace, and he gave him hope. He gave him something to look forward to. And so I will sum it up um, just with this verse again, Romans 6, 23. Um, the full verse says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Y'all, if we put our faith in Jesus, one day we'll be with him in paradise. Praise God. I'm using this because everybody else, you know, is using it, so... So I'm not doing one of the seven sayings, uh, but I'm just going to share a word, man. It's off the top. <laughs> just real quick, man. I was thinking about that word, uh, that word hope, man. And um, earlier today, uh, we had a neighbor over, uh, and she was talking to my, to, you know, talking to my wife. But I was air hustling, man. And um, she was just sharing, you know, uh, how discouraged she was, you know, the things that her family was going through, um, like being sick. Um, you know, their, their kids going through, you know, a bunch of things, man. And, uh, and you know, my wife just asking her, like, you know, like, do, do you believe or do you pray uh, to God? And, and just hearing um, the lack of faith that she had. Um, she's an Indian uh, lady. Um, so she shared how, you know, I guess their faith is Hindu. Um, and she's saying how she has lost, um, you know, faith in who she believes in. Um so I'm just listening to my wife talk, and, you know, she's talking to my wife about different things, and she's talking to her as if she has it all figured out, you know, as though my wife has it all figured out. So my wife is encouraging her, and I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm like, man, she thinks my wife, you know, has like a secret ingredient. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, she does. <laughs> she does have a secret ingredient. So as my wife is questioning her, you know, she's talking about her lack of faith, I'm just saying, man, like, she may not have the opportunity to hear about Jesus elsewhere, but she may have a chance to see it, you know, in us, man. So just thinking about that hope that we have, like having that uh, secret ingredient. So I'm just going to share a couple words, man. Oh, man. Since I was a young boy, I've always empathized with heroes who started from the bottom, counted out as a zero. But later, they will rise like a phoenix, no longer weirdos. Reminiscent of project dreams, we used to share those. <laughs> Mama used to yell at me, bringing this out my ear holes. Do better because I knew better. Toe the line like a free throw. If I was gassed up, a whooping set me to eco. <laughs> Motivated to broaden my vision outside the peephole. 
See, me goes for the culture, telling people I know her. Man who can help you weather the storm, no Al Roker. Power lifter, weight of the world up on the shoulders. In the beginning, a blueprint made to take over. Jehovah, Jireh, my provider. Ride with a ghost rider, the sky ain't the limit, I'm going higher. Built on faith like Nehemiah. The Lord declared he knew his plans for me, a book 29 of Jeremiah. To my old ways of Saganara. Been in tune and taking notes in life before I joined the choir. Plenty fall flat, fall flat cause they tired. Fell to acquire the breath of life, Jesus, the Messiah. Who while on the cross cried, Father, please forgive them. They tripping, even had two dudes with them. One was lifted up in the spirit, giving mercy, paradise, living a different rhythm from a stigmatism to some clear vision. Can I bring it back? <laughs> Who while on the cross cried, Father, please forgive them. They tripping. Even had two dudes with him. One was lifted up in the spirit, giving mercy, paradise living. A different rhythm from astigmatism to some clear vision. Said, listen, mother, I am him. The son sent, feeling forsaken by God with the weight of every sin. Still I thirst, can I take a sip? To tell a sty into thy hands, father, my spirit, I commend. Bowed head, held high above the rim. Bell torn, keys of death said, give me them. Though his death was wished upon by many men, the prophecy was, prophecy was fulfilled and three rose again. Now for those who believe, get the row with him. Notice kinfolk in the word of God, grow within. Those who think it's sweet now, later you're going to notice him. Alpha and Omega Elevator ain't a greater gem. <laughs> How was dead, now alive, the spirit lives within. I said I empathize with heroes in Christ, he is him. Good thing this is not a competition. I keep saying that because I had to follow that. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Well, you know, you can't choose your family, but you can choose to ignore their phone call. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your therapist. <laughs> you can't choose your family, but you can choose to turn them in for the reward. <laughs> family doesn't always show up for you. Family doesn't always accept you. Families aren't always able to make you feel that you belong. But we can't choose our families, right? We have zero choice about who our family is. But as Jesus is known to do, he takes a concept accepted by the world and turns it completely on its head, even as he wheezed his last breaths as he hung on the cross. John 19, 26 through 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This passage tells the story of the tender final moments before Jesus' death. These moments between Jesus and his mother, Mary. Jesus showed his deep love and care for his family as he hung dying. As an oldest son, Jesus spent his life providing for and protecting his widowed mother. And that didn't stop, and that didn't stop, that protection didn't stop in his last moments. In, in, in entrusting Mary to John and John to Mary, Jesus showed that he would continue to provide for them even in death. The Apostle John was devoted to Jesus and had already demonstrated his love and faithfulness in following him, but even more so by being the only one of the 12 to follow him to the cross. And Jesus noticed John standing there and saw a devotion that could be shared with his own beloved mother. One of Jesus' final acts before dying was to make a familial love connection, demonstrating for us how we are to view our fellow Christ followers as family. For the believer, this scenario at the cross is a powerful reminder of what family can be. It shows Jesus' love and care for his own mother, but it also serves as a model for how humanity should treat one another. Jesus was doing a new thing as his ministry was reaching its climax. He was creating a new and holy family, a family not given at birth, but a chosen one. 
a family in which we may not be blood related, but we are related by the blood of Jesus. We are a family with a purpose in showing our family resemblance. Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another and as he to love one another as he has loved us. And he taught as well that others will know that we are his disciples. How? By our love for one another. Our love, our unity, our compassion, our acceptance are all how others will find Jesus and become part of the family as well. Jesus didn't just have Mary and John's interest at heart as he hung on that cross. He showed us through them that beyond the hand we've been dealt, we can choose who we connect to. And in that connection, be joined in the body of Christ. John 17, 20 through 23 tells us that he prayed that, that he had prayed for his disciples uh, the night before his crucifixion and for the followers still to come. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, a united family. If your Christian community isn't family to you, either you don't feel worthy of the love given or you have the wrong community. Without the love Jesus commands, even the family of Christ can be just as dysfunctional as any other. Marked by spiritual abuse, judgment, abandonment, and competition. When ego and self overshadow the common bond we have in Jesus, we fail as family. We fail our Lord. Jesus prayed that we would be one. So when we are divided, when we mistreat and forget our brothers and sisters, we diminish Jesus' light and presence in the world. In the family of Christ, no one should feel like an orphan. No one should be left out, left, left out with open wounds. In Jesus' family, no sin against another should be left unredeemed. Jesus' family, like yours, may not be perfect, may not love perfectly, but the cross made a way for all of us to belong. The unconditional inclusion our hearts desperately long for should be the hallmark of any family especially the family of God. So John's love for Jesus made him Mary's family. How does your love for Jesus make you family to someone who needs it? Who, see, who, who, who is your Jesus family? And how well do you love one another? And is there room at the family table for one more? Good evening, everyone. So I would like to uh, thank Ahmed for um, choosing me for this uh, particular scripture. Even though in the beginning uh, I initially said, why was this given to me? I don't speak Aramaic, <laughs> but through much uh, prayer and studying, I realized at that moment that the scripture chose me. Matthew chapter 27 verses 45 through 46 reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Elahi, Elahi, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just to bring this into uh, context, our Lord is but hours from his death. And scripture says that darkness fell over all of the land. An eerie darkness had cast over for about three hours in the middle of the day. One could imagine that onlookers kind of felt out of place, right? A bit out of their element, confused even by this unexplained atmospheric phenomenon. And there hang he, our Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Savior of the whole world, in his final hours of despair. He had just been beaten, mocked, spat on, hung to a cross, and left for dead. Then he cries out one of the saddest things he could ever say. Elahi, Elahi, lema sabachthani, 
that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A cry so horrendous, so startling, that it would cause the earth to shake shortly after. Jesus, in utter anguish, asks his father, why? Why? Why does he? What could Jesus have been experiencing outside of the physical pain that he was feeling in that moment? So in his flesh, we know that Jesus, who was fully man, didn't want to endure death this way. And as a matter of fact, Luke chapter 22, verses 42 says that he asked that the cup be removed from him. And it continues to say that he prayed more and that his sweat became like great drops of blood because he knew what was to come. And what about Joseph? Jesus is earthly fire. Where is his father? Where is he? We don't hear too much about him. But we know something must have happened and something had to have taken place prior to this moment because Jesus takes the responsibility of entrusting John to care for his mother. His earthly father is gone and his heavenly father, who once declared how well pleased he was with him, is literally ghost. So now Jesus is hanging near death. He's reeking of the stench of the sins of the world. He's taking on the full wrath of God, and he is in complete darkness alone. Is it possible that he experienced some sort of physical or spiritual form of separation anxiety or daddy abandonment issues? So Jesus, he clearly fulfills the prophecy in Psalm 22 where he cries, where David actually cries out to God and he details his own grief of affliction. But then David later sings praises of God because Israel has not been forsaken. So then why does God forsaken Jesus? Why? A question I asked my earthly father when I was a little girl, when he had forgotten me. You see, my brother and I, we were born out of wedlock by two married adults. They just weren't married to each other. Love children, so to speak, but sometimes, you know, not feeling the love so much. My mother used to always tell me that the sins of the forefathers would fall on the children, and they definitely did. I remember going places with my dad and hearing him explain to others that I was his niece I remember having to tell people that someone else was my dad just, you know, to keep the appearances and make it less dramatic. I also remember receiving torn pictures of myself that my mother had mailed to my father and he returned back. I also remember being pushed aside to make room for the grieving family as we said goodbye to our father. Oh, I remember. For years I dealt with this feeling of rejection from the man who should have loved me first. And in turn, I subconsciously chased after the love of a man just to validate my mere existence. Every failed relationship fell victim to my own daddy abandonment issues. Christ, being fully divine, knew why he had to be forsaken. Scripture says that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through his perfect obedience by the way of submission to the will of his Father, he bore the whole wrath of God so that those who believe in him would have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. God the Father separated himself from, the, from his Son not because he didn't love his son anymore, but by through the sacrificing of his only son was able to extend his love to us. For the wages of sin is death. But Jesus knew that through his death, our sins would be forgiven. I may never fully understand why my father forsaken me, but I do know that in Christ, I am not the victim, but I am a victor. Hallelujah. 
And I have a heavenly father that calls me his child. So please, please be encouraged. God will not forsake you. Scripture says, if you fully put your trust in him and you believe, he promises to never leave you nor forsake you. God loves you. And his greatest act of love was sacrificing his son so that those who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's what John 3.16 is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. And in his ultimate display of sacrifice and obedience, Jesus bore our penalty and he died on the cross. But oh, he rose again. <laughs> Hallelujah. And because of that, we no longer have to cry out, Elahi, Elahi, Lama Sabachthani. But instead, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you. John 19, 28 through 29 says, Later, knowing that everything had been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. You know, Jesus, our ultimate example, left us another amazing example. Do you allow people to serve you when you're suffering? Would you allow the people who hurt you to even get close enough to contribute to your healing? You know, there are several accounts of Jesus being offered this drink. Matthew 27, verse 34 and 48 records two times he's offered this drink on the cross. In verse 34, it says, they gave him wine mixed with bow to drink, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. In verse 48, it says, immediately one ran, taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, similar to what happens in John. In Mark 15, verse 36, it says, a bystander ran up and gave him something to drink, similar to what happens in John. Luke 23, starting in verse 36, says that they kept giving him a drink, the soldiers that, to mock him. So they offered this wine mixed with bow several times, like, drink this, drink this, drink this. If we combine these narratives, we get a picture where the soldiers and the teachers of the law are mocking Jesus. They're saying, save yourself. They're giving them this wine mixed with this vow to prolong the mockery. Drink this a little bit so we got some more time at this. Then you have the ones that Jesus loved. John, Mary Magdalene, his mother, and others. Strangers standing by watching this. Heartbroken. Can you imagine being tortured and mocked by the people you came to save and still have the capacity to let someone help you, to let someone quench your thirst. You know, when we hurting, we don't want nobody to come close. We even stiff arm God. Sometimes we even blame God and get mad at God at the things he told us will be a part of our walk, like suffering. Hebrews 7, Hebrews 5, 7 through 8 says, In the days of his humanity, he, Jesus, offered up both prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his devout behavior. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. From the things he suffered. You know, Jesus suffered 
well. And he suffered so well that those who were contributing to his suffering got convicted. And they was like, truly, this is the son of God. Truly, this is the son of God. See, suffering was always part of the plan. Jesus knew the prophecies about him suffering and that he would be disfigured beyond human uh, observation, that people wouldn't even know what he looked like. He knew this, but he also knew God loved him. Jesus suffered well. Mark, sorry, Matthew 27, 54 says, When the centurion and those with him who were guiding, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Is God's power so evident in your suffering that people look at you and claim truly he or she? is a child of God? It's a hard teaching. It's a hard teaching. Like when I was around seven years old going in and out of foster care because my parents got addicted to drugs. And then as a teenager, I had to go back and live with my father. I had to learn how to suffer well. I had to learn to forgive him. This was not easy. This was not easy. But what we see on the cross is what happens when you suffer well. And not for no reason. We're not just out here suffering, right? Like, but for God. But for God. Are you suffering well for God? That's, if you're walking with Jesus, he said, you sign enough to suffer like God. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so he's going to give us challenges. But are we suffering well either? Just like him on the cross, people are watching. Our kids, our spouses, our family, our community, people are watching. They see how we're dealing with our suffering. They see what we want to run to or what we run to. Is God's power so evident in your suffering that people can look at you and me and say, that's a child of God? I pray that it is. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. The children are just want to stand up around me because they're used to seeing me on Sunday. I'm not standing up here, but I'm usually standing up here singing. Come over, sweet. Come on. Sit down. That's okay. He's okay. He's okay. Who knows the difference between fiction and nonfiction? Micah? It's made up by man. Give him a hand, everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, God's word, the Bible, is based on truth. And I found this book. It says, Why is there a cross? And I know, parents, grandparents, if you don't give a child a good answer, they're going to say, Why? 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 So, in this little book, I want everybody to look up here at me. It's called, Why is There a Cross? I want to know what's so good about today. It's Friday. We're going to find out. Yes, you have an answer? What's so good, what's so good about Friday? Uh, 
We're going to come over to your friend's house. But this is called Good Friday. And I'm wondering what we're going to find out what's so good about it. And another question that's going to be answered in this book, why is there a cross? When I am in church, in some churches, I look all around. I'm always, what's wrong? You'll be okay. I'm always trying not to make a sound. I'm always trying to sit still. Look how cute he is sitting here all nice. You see him? Okay. I see on the wall from the place where I sit a very large cross. In some churches you do. Why? We'll find out. I'm telling you, they're going to ask why. I know that when Jesus was ready to die, he died on the cross, but I'm wondering why. What did he do that was so very wrong? Why couldn't everyone... Just get along. Sometimes we don't know either. Did Jesus feel sad? This is a question I was thinking about. Do you think he was scared? I wonder, did Jesus think that nobody cared? Yes, they're all quiet now. Good job, guys. Why did his life have to turn out this way? Could Jesus have changed it by running away? That's right. But he had the power, but he wouldn't because we'll find out why. How can I manage to do my own part to show I love Jesus with all of my heart? Watch your finger down there. You might get it pinched. I'll let you see later. You're wanting to know what the cross is all about? Are you wanting to know what the cross is all about? It isn't so easy to figure it out. Let's look through the Bible, God's word, for then we will see why the cross is important to you and me. Somebody's answering, sure. The crosses we see, both large and small, remind us that Christ gave his life for all. That means whether you're big, you're small, you're thin, you're fat. Well, not fat. You're heavy. <laughs> his death on the cross was part of the plan that God had in mind when creation began. That's in the book of Genesis. God created the world, the heavens and the earth. Raise your hand if you've heard that story, and the moon, the stars, and the sky. Yes, good job. Although we may struggle with all our might, there's simply no way we're always going to do right. Did any of you hear the adults talk about that? <laughs> Jesus was willing to die for our sins. That's all the things that we do, will do, forget about that we did, didn't realize we did it. He gave up his life so that we can win. 
Come on. Yeah. Give each other a high five. Woo, 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 woo. That's what we need to be joyful about. Jesus is perfect, as good as can be. He went to the cross so that we could be free. Yes. Amen. Free from the power of sin, free from the power of death, free to praise Jesus with every breath. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And you guys have a lot of breath. I heard somebody shouting really loud over there. Even though Jesus did just what God asked, facing the cross was a difficult task. Someone just talked about that in another language. Jesus, just before Jesus was taken away, he went to the garden and he knelt down to pray. He said with a great, great sadness, dear God, help me through this. You know that I'll do what you asked me to do. Jesus could face then what had to be done. He knew that God loved him, for he was God. God. Good job. He went to the cross on this good Friday. That's what's good about this Friday. He went to the cross to die for our sins. He obeyed God right to the very end. A few friends of his were right by his side. Although it is sad that our Lord had to die, Christ rose from the dead, and that is not a lie. Because Jesus lives, we can share in his glory and this is the truth of the whole Easter story. The cross, which was once such a terrible sight, now shines. One got away. He'll be back. <laughs> Wait till he sees what I had to give to you parents over there. Now shines with the beauty of God's holy light. If you trust in Jesus, and give him your best, you'll show that you love him and you will be blessed. Amen. Here's a greater truth. Nothing can keep you apart from God's love. No, nothing on this earth or heaven above. Death cannot stop it. Not worry or fear. God's love is forever. So be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Yay! The story. The main thing I wanted the children to learn today is the beauty of the cross. Yes, we think about cross as being a horrible thing, but there is a beautiful, beautiful story of his great sacrifice. And I have something for the parents to follow through on this great poem for children. You can create your own visuals, but I have scriptures because I want them to know that this is from God's word. Children, listen up. His death on the cross was part of the plan that God had in mind when what began? In mind, in your mind. His mind. When creation began. God chose Christ as your ransom long before the world began. And that's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. So each one of you, your family members, that means the two of you are in one family, the four of you are in one family, get one. And here's the cross. The cross is empty because Christ arose. But the scriptures are for your parents to help you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Simple song, it simply says that you make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things, you You may. 
Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say that I, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you. Um, as you can tell by there, I'm not part of this congregation, but I am grateful uh, and super excited to be here with you all. Um, the word that I have uh, is in John 19, verse 30, and it says, when Jesus has received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know, there is so much meaning in these words. And to really squeeze all the meaning that there are in these simple words and yet super powerful words, uh, I need to transport you in time. So we're going to do a little exercise here. And with your mind and with your heart, we're going to travel back in time 
to about 2,000 years ago. And I want you to imagine that you are up on a mound where they usually kill people, all right? And it smells like dead bodies because usually they kill them and they don't throw them off very far away from where you are. It is the middle of the day and it is spring. And in the desert, it is hot. And you are in a crowd of people and they smell and they're shouting and you're really close to them. And off to your left, you see a group of people that are very familiar to you because they're dressed in a very particular way, and they're the Sadducees. And they're the religious leaders of the time. And when they hear the words, it is finished, you kind of see a hint of satisfaction in their faith. In their faith. Because to them, these words may, mean that this man who opposed them this man who criticized them, this man who they thought was going to begin a rebellion, this nuisance is now dead. And now to your right, you see a real small group of people. And there's a mother and another young woman and another man. And what you see in their face is utter defeat. Because to a mom, an innocent man, her innocent son, has died. To the men and the woman, John and Mary, their friend, their teacher, the man who had they put all of their hope in, is now dead. Same scene, hearing the same voices, and to them, it strikes them in two completely different ways. And yet, they have one thing in common. They are both not understanding what Jesus just said. The word that Jesus uses in Greek for it is finished can have many meanings. And one of them is something being done, like you, you, know, you finish your meal, it's finished. And it's usually related to a task. And it can mean finished, but it can also mean complete. In other Bible verses, we translate this word as perfect. And the Greek meaning of perfection isn't the one like the one that we think of where something is flawless. In the Greek, the meaning of perfect means complete, something that has been made whole. And it is at this moment that they have lost sight of the hand and the work of God. Because to God, this is not the end. To God, this is the culmination of his sovereign work. It is literally thousands of years of moving all the pieces for this very moment. Because what is happening in this moment is all of the promises of God all of the things that he promised people were going to happen are happening with the words, it is complete. The king of his kingdom is being crowned. People are being redeemed. The temple is being built anew. A new nation is about to begin made of people who have renewed hearts. This is what completion is. This is the work of our sovereign God. And as we sit here, as you're sitting on this mount, I want you to travel a few more hundred years in the past. Because now, we're Israelites. All right? And we are in a foreign land. And our city has been destroyed. We no longer have a country, country. And we are living on the oppression of another nation. And some guy named Ezekiel comes and makes a prophecy. In Ezekiel 40 through 48, we're not going to read all of it, obviously, because that's seven, eight chapters of the Bible, right? In Ezekiel 40 through 48, 
Ezekiel has this amazing vision. And again, in this moment, the Israelites are in utter defeat. They're away from their home. They're under the rule of somebody else. Their temple has been destroyed. Their priests are dead. Their leaders are dead. Their word is lost. And here's this man named Ezekiel that has this vision of the future temple being rebuilt and the borders of Israel being redrawn. And this is meant as an encouragement for what the Christ is going to do. And at the tail end of this vision, after he describes the temple in like great detail, down to the measurements of what it's going to look like, Ezekiel has this vision of water coming out of the threshold of the entrance of the temple. And it's just that little tiny stream. And as this water trickles down the steps and it moves towards the east, it little by little becomes a river that's ankle high. I mean, a little stream that is ankle high. And then a few miles down the road, it comes up to somebody's knees. And then it turns into a river. What's east of Jerusalem is the desert. And as this stream coming from the temple moves east, what it creates, what it creates from a, a desolate desert is a lush land with fruit, with fish, with animals that live off of this river. When Jesus says it is complete, he is ushering that vision, that stream that makes a desert into a lush land. What it is, is that it's, it's the reversal of the curse. This is garden imagery. A garden that was blessed with plenty. And in so many ways, this is our story. When we understand the crucifixion, when we understand the resurrection, we've all come, or we may still be, in our own deserts. And these words, it is finished, are an invitation to a lush, blessed, plentiful place. And so here we are, now back in our time machine today, thousands of years later, blessed with perspective. Because we are neither the Sadducees, nor Jesus' mom, nor John, nor Mary, we are here, knowing the full story. We know what happens on Sunday. They didn't. And here is, again, an invitation away from the desert and to, into, into a lush land full of fruit, life, and blessing. Thank you. There you go. There you go. That was good. So, y'all, Jesus has been enduring an extreme execution, a vehemently violent vexing as he hangs on the cross now for about six hours. Can you imagine what that must feel like? The entire world is now totally dark. Can you see it? The sky has surrendered its sunlight as it stands in solidarity with all of creation in protest of the Son of Man's suffering. Hear the sun saying, oh no, I won't glow. Oh no, I won't glow. Considering this was the time of Passover, there was likely tens of thousands of people converged upon Jerusalem. Very likely hundreds of thousands more were clustered all around the holy city. As this was the place at the time. This is where you want it to be. Can you hear the thunderous roar of this Super Bowl parade? Super Bowl champions parade size crowd. I mean... Just clamoring and gathering. Lots of people. People on top of people. The, the chaotic clamor of this grand gathering must be just disorientingly deafening. The smell of blood, and sweat, and dirt navigates through the nostrils and subdues the senses of everyone in attendance. All the while, Jesus, he's hanging on the cross. This, the pain that this persecution was proposed to put on was so great 
that a word had to be created to correctly construe it. The word excruciating is of Latin origin. It's derived from two words, ex, which means out of, and cruce or crux, as we pronounce it, which is to mean a cross. Together, they formed the word excruciere, which was transliterated in about the 1600s, literally meaning out of crucifying. Hmm. Torment, pain, agony, out of crucifying. He's lonely. He's beaten. He's worn. He's exhausted. Y'all got to picture the Savior being dehydrated. And in spite of all of his immeasurable affliction, y'all, Jesus is still in control. Wow. Y'all, the Most High is lonely. He's beaten. He's worn. He's exhausted. He's dehydrated. And in spite of all of his immeasurable affliction, Yeshua is still, say it with me, in control. Yeah, yeah. The measure of strength that's exhibited by the Savior in this moment is absolutely profound. As each of us can testify, usually at our greatest moments of pain and suffering and weakness that we tend to demonstrate a lack of self-control, right? Whether that pain is long-term, like the loss of a loved one, which causes us to lash out and just uh, doubt God and cease to care for ourselves in healthy ways. Or if that pain is more short-term, like, like if we just stubbed our toe and rattled off an impromptu Samuel Jackson monologue. <laughs> but y'all, Jesus here, he demonstrated stunning self control. And so let's look here at Luke chapter 23 verses 44 to 46 as we just round this thing out and explore the matter at hand more closely. Verse 44 says, it was now about the sixth hour, that's noon y'all, and there was darkness all over the whole land until about the ninth hour. Can you picture that? It's noon. Hey, where's the sun? So immediately we see the correlation here between Jesus and Moses. If you know a little bit about the Bible, uh, this is a sign of judgment. Back in Exodus, we see Moses marching up the Pharaoh, demanding to have his people freed from bondage and freed from captivity and slavery. And here in Jerusalem, we see Jesus marching up the Via Della Rosa, up Calvary's hill, as he delivers himself as a once and for all sacrifice in order to free his people from bondage, from captivity, and from slavery. Verse 45 says, the sun's light faded. And the curtain of the temple was torn into two. So in the temple where innocent lambs were sacrificed in order to cleanse us of our sin temporarily, a veil was hanging to separate the Holy of Holies from where men dwelt, right? Signifying that man was separated by God because of our sin, right? This place was so holy that only the high priest could go beyond it to enter into God's presence just once a year for the purpose of making atonement for Israel's sins. So without a doubt, uncoincidentally, just a little while away, just a little while away, our Savior is hanging on the cross. And as his body is ripped to pieces in order to bridge the gap between God and man, the veil in the temple separating God from man is torn. Where once only the chosen high priest could enter into God's presence on our behalf for yearly atonement, now the true high priest is entering into God's wrath on our behalf for eternal atonement. Verse 46 says, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he then breathed his last breath. And so the word calling out, cried out, shouting out in its uh, original Greek is a word phaneo. Somebody say phaneo. Say phaneo. Okay, all right. I appreciate y'all. It gives this imagery of uh, the emitting of a sound that's similar to like a rooster's crow, right? So while uh, suffocating, Jesus having control over all creation, right? All creation, always, all of the time, exemplifies his dominion over even his own body by meeting pain head on and conquering it as he achingly elevates himself up to pull in enough oxygen, right? In order to emit a sound that's loud enough to wake up those who are currently and will be in the future sleeping on them. Right? Those who are doubting his divinity. About 2,000 years before Spike Lee ever penned it or Lawrence Fishburne ever uttered it, here is Jesus screaming to the schools of fish blindly in the days. That's what he says, y'all. He said, wake up! Wake up! Jesus screams out. He screams out. He says, Father, into your hands. 
I commit my spirit. He says, Papa, into your hands. I commit my, he says, Daddy, into your hands. I commit my spirit. Commit. And it's original, uh, original Greek is uh, the word paratithame. We're teaching y'all. Say paratithame. Paratithame. All right. It means to deposit, uh, to entrust, or to commit to one's charge. And so Jesus was fully aware and undoubtedly uh, convinced that in the midst of all of his turmoil and tragedy, y'all, there was no safer place in all of the world, in all of eternity, to entrust his spirit than into the hands of his father. Right? Even though it was at the hands of his father that all of his calamity commenced, Jesus still saw the safest place to entrust his spirit was right back into those same hands. Isaiah 53, 10 said, it pleased the Father to crush him. How, how does that make sense? How does it make sense? I mean, there's some parents in here. We discipline our children, but does it please us? Usually we say, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Huh? Y'all, you don't say that? No? Okay, my mom ain't never said that either. <laughs> I mean, I said some parents say stuff like that. You know, not all of them. I've seen it on movies. Say people say that kind of thing. You know? But why? Why does that make sense, right? Why would it make sense for God the Father to be pleased to crush his only begotten son? Not just his son, his only begotten son. Why would that make sense? And why would Jesus be cool with that? Why would he be cool with that? Somebody say, why? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked, y'all, because I want to share two quick highlights. Let's read the entire verse for the first. It says uh, in the New Living Transma uh, Translation, it says in verse 10 of Isaiah 53, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he'll have many descendants. He'll enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Y'all, so Jesus being the greatest steward, right? The greatest steward. He placed his life into the Father's hands in the midst of the Father's judgment upon him for our sin because he was certain that it was a safe investment. Jesus knew that the Father's words were sure. He knew that the Father's character, his reputation was sure. He was there with the Father at the formation of all creation when the Father said, let there be, and everything was. He knew the Father was reliable. Yeah, thank you, Jazz, reliable. He knew the Father was persuasive. He knew the Father was powerful. Jesus knew his Father was dependable. Let's look at verse 11 real quick. The second one says, when he sees all that's accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Man, it pleased the father to crush his only son to place upon him all of our guilt, gunk, and garbage because the father's joy is Jesus' joy. The father loves his son. He's going to do whatever is necessary to bring him joy, true satisfaction even if that means momentary affliction, mm. even if that means uh, emotional separation, even if that means physical discomfort or even social excommunication, y'all, the Father knew that Jesus would be satisfied when he sees all that was accomplished by his anguish. Man, come on, y'all. Every hurt, every tear, every heartbreak, every fear, Every test, every trial, every ounce of pain, whether physical, mental, or emotional, none of the things we experience will be enough to break us. Why? Because Jesus was already broken for us. See, the Father knew that because of the magnitude of Jesus' love for us, seeing our salvation will make everything that he endured worthwhile. What kind of love is that? Do y'all know a love like that? No matter what the particulars of the fall of man are playing themselves out in our lives, right? Because all of us got them. No matter what they are particularly for you, no matter how we struggle, how we wrestle, Jesus loves us so much that our salvation is enough to satisfy him in spite of all of his suffering. Y'all, it's absolutely true that Jesus suffered because of us. He suffered because of us. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. There was no reason for him to be crucified. He was the one who was without sin. It's no doubt that Jesus suffered because of us. But we should find incredible comfort in the fact that Jesus also suffered for us. Not just because of us, but he also suffered for us. And he did so well. So family, in closing, I'd like to contend to you today that Jesus did not stumble upon the cross. 
right? Yeah, he, he was weak in war. He was beaten and bruised. He was dehydrated and debilitated. And he may have stumbled up Calvary's Hill to the cross, but he did not stumble upon the cross. Now, like I said before, I'm not, I'm not an eye doctor. I'm not an optometrist. I got on glasses myself. But I believe with all of my being, y'all, that Jesus was cross-eyed. All right, what I'm saying is that from every moment that he opened his eyes with effervescence to earthly endeavors, he had Calvary in his crosshairs. Every single moment the Savior lived, loved, laughed, lamented, every lash received, laceration endured, bloody drop that leaked from the Savior's head was infused with intentionality inspired by this instance. Y'all, when he taught in the temple and he told his mother that he was about his father's business, he could see the cross. When he was baptized by his cousin and heaven opened up while the Holy Spirit gave him a pat on the back of affirmation and the father verbally affirmed him, y'all, he could see the cross. When he overcame Satan's temptation in the wilderness while he was fasting for 40 days, he could see the cross. When he made a party that was on the brink of becoming viral for all the wrong reasons, doing about face by turning 180 gallons of water into wine, y'all, he could see the cross. See, when Jesus called the 12, when he healed the sick, when he preached the sermon on the mount, when he told his boy, Lazarus my boy get up he could see the cross Jesus never lost sight of the mission at hand family on the cross Jesus endured the most excruciating pain that anyone had ever known and I'm not talking about the nails that were piercing his wrist I'm not talking about the suffocation or the dehydration it wasn't the crown of thorns cutting through the flesh covering his cranium no the most excruciating pain that Jesus endured on the cross was the agony of abandonment. See, so y'all, for a brief moment, and for the first time throughout all of eternity, Jesus was able to sympathize with so many of us who had experienced the devastation of daddylessness. See, Jesus had, for the first time ever, experienced what it was like to be alone. And so many of us are struggling, we're wrestling with this idea of being alone, whether it's because your loved one left you, whether it's because you just feel like you just can't connect with people, you're a loner, a lone wolf, whatever the case is, but you don't want to be that way. You're struggling. You wish your loved one was still here with you. Whether it was mama who passed, daddy who passed, a spouse who passed, a child who passed, you struggle in your heart with this idea, but I want you to know that Jesus understands. Jesus knows what it's like to feel that kind of separation. He knows what it's like to long for someone. Jesus committed his life into his daddy's hands, y'all. Nobody took it from him. Did you know that? Nobody took it from him. What did he do? He, he laid it down. He gave it just as he promised he would. In John chapter 10, where he says in verses 17 and 18, this is why the father loves me, because I laid down my life, so that I may take it up again. Right? He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. And then he goes on to say, I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up. And I received this command from my father. Y'all, if y'all haven't gotten it already, Jesus and the father are working on this thing together. Right? They're in cahoots. They agreed on this particular plan all for the purpose of redeeming us and bringing joy to themselves. And so, listen, as we navigate this life, as we experience all these ups and downs, may we keep the cross in our sight. The cruise or the crux of Jesus' ministry was for sure the cross. But the cross is not intended to only be the highlight of Jesus' earthly ministry. Y'all, it's absolutely to be the launching pad of all of ours as well. And so may our life's commitment in the face of everything that we experience be into the sure, the capable, the reliable, the dependable hands of the Father. Amen? Amen. 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 Father. We take this moment to give you glory, to thank you for being just who you've always promised to be. Lord, there's nobody like you. We, we, can, we can bank on you. We thank you for Christ and for his willingness to endure all that he did on our behalf. We thank you for him empathizing and sympathizing with us. We thank you so much, Father, that Christ met his fears head on his discomforts head on, and that he endured the cross for us. And so on this Good Friday, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that our hearts would be encouraged, that we will be inspired, that we will be motivated to live lives that are bold, that are courageous, 
because of what Christ has done for us. Lord, may we live lives of sacrifice, of faithfulness, of commitment, and of true and genuine faith. Lives that are marked by the reality of Jesus, our Messiah's great decision to climb up on a cross and die for us. Lord, we know Good Friday isn't really good in and of itself, but it's good because we all know Sunday's coming. And so, Father, even as we leave here tonight, we pray that our heart's posture will be set to this perspective of expectation, moment by moment, on what the Savior has accomplished for us. Y'all, like Rodrigo said, we, we don't have to pretend like, like we don't know. We see the full picture. The Savior was on the cross, but he's not anymore. And so I pray for all of us that that reality would transform our thoughts and then transform our lives. Would you be glorified in all things? In Jesus' name, we pray that you will bless our time together. We got some food. We pray that you will bless it. That be good and nourishing you be glorified in all of our conversation as we love you while we love one another. Thank you, Father. Amen.